For those of you who don't know me, I'm Robert Schein. I welcome you to the Rowerton Center for International Studies, so this International Studies Colloquium. Uh, I teach Jewish Studies here. I'm the Silverman Professor of Jewish Studies, and it's on behalf of the program in Jewish Studies, supported by the Akina Fund, uh, and on behalf of the Rowerton Center, that I welcome you all, and thank you for coming. But I also want to thank uh, the, the many people who make these events possible. Uh, Alison Stanger, the director of the Rowton Center, Charlotte Tate, the associate director, who is here, Martha Baldwin, the administrator of the Rowton Center, Scott Witt, our tech, uh, Charlotte Barrett, uh, Charlene Barrett, the coordinator of the religion department. Uh, all of these people uh, make these events happen, from the posters to the uh, lunch that you're enjoying. Now, this is also the, the first colloquium taking place in the renovated conference room, so the new color, the new carpet, uh, if it feels fresh, there's a reason. It was closed over winter term and now is back open for business. So in the summer of 2005, I visited our Middlebury colleague Ted Sasson and his family at Kibbutz Gatura and saw the Arava Institute for the first time. And I encountered there a remarkable student body, uh, Israelis, both Jews and Arabs, uh, some students from the Palestinian territories, from the occupied territories, students from Jordan, Egypt, um, all of whom were gathered there studying environmental policy and environmental science, contemplating careers in education or in civil service, journalism, and all of them seeing uh, from the perspective of Kibbutz Keturah, situated in the Negev, in the desert, in the south of Israel, just a few miles from Jordan on the one side, and not so many more miles from Gaza and Egypt on the other side, um, gaining the perspective that, that though the Middle East may be sliced up politically many different ways, from an ecological perspective, it is one ecosystem. Rabbi Michael Cohn has been involved in the Arava Institute since its inception as a founding faculty member in 1996. And the path leading there started somewhere uh, in his career, he might explain that. Um, but uh, one of the way stations on that career was the University of Vermont, from which he graduated with the History Award uh, and wrote a thesis, an honors thesis, on Lenin's theory of self-determination and the Muslims of the Soviet Union. And Rabbi Cohn just told me when we were uh, speaking before that he was very aware of studying the problem of minorities and nationalism, uh, seeking insight, insight on the situation in the Middle East by studying it obliquely through the position of Muslims in the Soviet Union under Lenin. He then went on to rabbinical studies and was ordained at the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College in 1990 and was rabbi of the Israel congregation in Manchester, Vermont from 1990 to 2000. He also served as the president of the Reconstructionist Rabbinical Association, a position that's also been held by our rabbi, Ira Schiffer. And it was, um, so we have former presidents here, that's always elite company. The, pre the president's lunch today. Yes. Uh, it was on, while, while on sabbatical from the congregation in Manchester that, uh, that he taught at the Arava Institute. And he returned to the Arava Institute in the year 2000. From 2001 to 2006, he served as the executive director of the Arava Institute North America and in 2002 co-founded the Zionist Green Alliance, which was the first environmental Zionist party to be represented at the World Jewish Congress. At the Arava Institute, he's also worked on Palestinian student recruitment, on development, uh, on other projects, and taught two courses, one of them, Genesis as a Key to Environmental Thought, and another, Moses, a Study of Leadership and Environmental Wisdom. At present, he's the director of special projects for the Friends of the Arava Institute. He's written a number of, number of articles and also a novel just recently published titled Einstein's Rabbi, A Tale of Science and the Soul. Aside from caring about the environment in the Middle East, 
He also sits on the Energy and Tree Committee of the town of Manchester, Vermont. I wanted to mention before we begin that uh, those of you who are interested in a possible semester at the Arba Institute will have an opportunity to talk with Rabbi Cohn after the talk. Um, we, you, those of you who know the routine here know that we're informal. You should feel free to get coffee during the talk. We'll, we will conclude promptly at 1.30 and we have a small clock here to remind us. <laughs> I know there's a concern that rabbis talk too much, but or too long, but <laughs> yes. In fact, at one of the first lectures in Jewish studies given here by Rabbi Arthur Hertzberg in 1988, he started his talk by announcing that he would speak for 40 minutes, and he said, "I tell you that so that you know that my words, though uh, though eternal, uh, but though immortal, will not be eternal." <laughs> So we're at a time, it seems, when environmental issues in the Middle East are obscured by political conflict. Um, for instance, in Israel on Tuesday, the one party that ran on an issue of environmental, on an environmental platform, pulled less than 2% under the threshold for parliamentary representation. At a time when the, when the chasm separating our present from some future of peace seems only to widen, we look forward to a talk titled Environment as a Bridge to Peace in the Middle East. So please join me in welcoming Rabbi Michael Cohn. It's great to be here. So uh, thank you for all coming out to this wonderful new room here. I love the light. Um, I want to thank uh, Robert and the, uh, the Center for inviting me here, and also say hello to my camera over there as, as well. Um, I had a plug for my book, but you already did that. Um, but I will say that it's, it, it deal, it, Einstein also um, was a Zionist, and I think he had some very prophetic things to say about Zionism, particularly when we talk about the issues today, and that's one of the issues that gets addressed in the book in, 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 in addition to the conversation between science and religion. Um, so I just put it out there for whatever it's worth. Um, also, Tom Benson, which I think a number of you know, the former president of Green Mountain College, and now working with the World Education Corps, is on our board here in the United States. And I know that the World Education Corps is working on joint programs here at Middlebury College um, as well. So I want to talk about kind of the environment in general of the Middle East and bring it down to the program and then talk more generally again. Um, there are those who say that the, the environmental movement of the world began on uh, Erev Christmas or Christmas Eve um, 1968 when the um, Apollo 8 spacecraft that was sent up much earlier than it was supposed to have been sent up because we were in this wonderful race with the, the Russians and we needed to show them that we were going to win this race. And so the Apollo 8 mission was moved up. And many of you will remember that as the spaceship circled uh, the moon and we humans for the first time saw, if you will, a, a God's view of the Earth. But we saw that view of the, the Earth rise from the moon. The three Apollo astronauts read from the beginning of the book of Genesis. And there are many people who say that that moment is really what birthed the modern environmental movements around the world because we finally had that both existential and tangible view of that this is one home. And that when you looked at this marble, that colorful marble that the Earth is in, in space, one didn't see any of those divisions of countries. One just saw a home that we all share. And it's, it's, it's not without accident that two years later, we then have the first Earth Day in 1970. Um, but many people say that is, that's the moment with, as, when there's the consciousness of the environmental movements are really birthed. If we telescope the environment of the Earth to the Middle East, we find, as within all places in the world, many, many issues that need to be confronted. Um, Often there's similar issues, though, with different ways of, of having to deal with them. For one, air quality um, has become a major um, source of worry for those uh, in Israel, the Palestinian Authority, and in Jordan. All of the rivers in that part of the world are polluted. 
um, some of them literally lethally. And I'm going to give a list now, and I'll come back to them uh, later on. Um, clean water, enough water um, in that part of the world is an acute problem and a growing problem. The concept of open space, how do we preserve open space as we have more and more people being born there who need a place to live, who don't want to live in the cities, yet how do we preserve the open spaces that remain there? Energy needs, uh, needless to say, as populations grow the, and as people become more middle class, more bourgeois, and they need more material things, there's more of a need for energy as well. The most northern coral reefs in the world actually happen to lie in the Gulf of Aqaba a lot. Um, they are under tremendous strain, and they both go, they're both in, uh, they're in Jordan, um, Israel, and in Egypt, um, and actually go all the way down to Saudi Arabia. And then there's the Dead Sea, this unique ecosystem, this unique place, both historically and politically, uh, religiously in the world, that is literally disappearing as we speak. So those are a number of the environmental issues um, that we face in that part of the world. I first want to go and talk a bit about the Arava Institute and how we prepare ourselves to address those. Um, and then I want to examine them um, and open up for questions. So the Arava Institute is the premier environmental teaching and research program in the Middle East, preparing future Arab and Jewish leaders to cooperatively solve the region's environmental challenges. Or to put it another way, we teach students today so nations will work together tomorrow. The institute was founded in 1996 by Dr. Alon Tal, who at that point was a member of Kibbutz Kitara. Um, he's one of the leading environmental activists and lawyers uh, in Israel. Uh, the Green Party that was just referred to what was one of his latest creations. Um, unfortunately, they did not uh, get enough votes to um, stand in the Knesset, but they made a very, very important point. And actually, David Lair, the director of the Arava Institute, had an op-ed piece in Haaretz. It was either yesterday or the day before, where basically he said by this party coming in, all of the parties had environmental pieces on their platforms and that, that, that we really raised the bar on how the environment is talked about, uh, at least within the Israeli political system. So in the wake of the Israel-Jordan Peace Treaty in 1994, and at that point still the Oslo peace process, Dr. Tal felt it was imperative that there needed to be a regional center in the Middle East where Israelis and her Arab neighbors could come together and be given both the personal connections and the professional training to go on and become environmental leaders in that part of the world. That is, the raison d'etre of the Institute is, is that there will be a cadre of future um, environmental leaders. Our dream is that the, at one point the, uh, in the future, the Minister of the Environment for Israel, the Palestinian Authority, and Jordan will all be graduates of the program, and that they will know each other, so it'll be much more easy for them to talk to themselves, not just as professionals, but they'll have a personal relationship as well. To do this, we bring together a very, very mixed student body that is one, ideally, and it fluctuates depending on politics and, and other, other variables. Ideally, it's uh, one-third Jewish, one-third Arab, meaning Israeli Arab, Palestinian, Jordanian. We've had some Egyptian and Tunisian, but mostly Palestinian and Jordanian. And then one-third the rest of the world, the majority from um, North America. And you should know Vermont is colleges have been very, very active part of this. The University of Vermont has sent us more students than any other university in the United States. And we're finalizing now where the time that students from UVM study at Arava will be a minor on their transcript. They also have a diversity requirement at the University of Vermont, and this will count towards the diversity requirement um, as well. But we've had students also from Middlebury attend, from Green Mountain College, from Bennington. We've had a number of our students come back to Vermont and study at the Vermont Law School because of their great environmental law work that they do there, and also at SIT in Brattleboro. So we've got this wonderful connection between various um, Vermont academic institutions. I, we would love to see more students from Middlebury come on the program, and so I see a number of you are here, and I would be more than happy to talk to you about studying um, with us. In addition, the Vermont congressional delegation has really been a lifesaver for us, particularly Senator Leahy, who, as you know, sits on the, uh, is the chair of the Foreign Appropriations Committee um, and helped establish the Office of Conflict Management and Mitigation at USAID. We've gotten a number of grants through that office through the efforts of Senator Leahy, and the first one we actually got saved the program. It was shortly after the uh, second intifada, and things had literally dried up. 
And had we not gotten that grant, we would have probably had closed shop. And so we are really greatly indebted to, to the senator who has visited our students in Israel. Many of the students uh, visit him uh, when they're in Washington. In addition, um, at then Congressman Sanders, now Senator Sanders, wrote the Israel Hour Peace Partners Program, of which we got four grants for, where we bring our students to the United States. They go to Washington for a couple of days, learn about the relationship of the environment to government. Um, and then they do environmental internships around the United States. One of the summers, all those students were actually in Burlington, Vermont, doing environmental internships there. Um, so Senator Sanders has been a longtime supporter of ours as well, as was um, Senator Jeffords also when he was a senator. And Congressman Welsh, um, though he's you know, only a little over into his beginning of his second term, met with our students um, in Jerusalem with Senator Leahy a year ago in May. And I've met with him a number of times and also is a great champion of ours. So we are really, really blessed um, that we have these great connections with both the Vermont Education Institutes as well as the Vermont Congressional uh, Delegation. We're accredited through Ben Gurion University. And we have uh, an undergraduate track and a, uh, a master's track. We have a summer program that's four weeks. That's a four credit course. That's kind of the highlights of the year. And then we have your classic fall and or spring semester. You can do one or both of them on the undergraduate level, and the credit would transfer, in this case, back to Middlebury College. And we also have a two-year master's program, where you do a year at our, at our campus on, at Kibbutz Kitara, and then you do the second year at the Stabokia Research Center of Ben Gurion University, and you get a master's degree from Ben Gurion University. Typically, students take five classes a semester in environmental policy in social and cultural issues, in environmental sciences. Um, there's an interdisciplinary class that everybody takes. One semester it's in water management, and one semester it's in desert issues. And then there's an independent study that everyone takes, and that's all over the place in terms of the possibilities. Um, half a billion birds literally twice a year fly over the kibbutz on their way from Africa to Europe, Asia, and then six months later they come back. Um, so students um, do research there, and it's actually pretty amazing. You'll, some, you'll go out of the office one day, and you'll see literally hundreds of cranes in a circle catching a thermal as they to go up and then hit the, the turnpike going north or south, depending on which season it is. As I mentioned, the coral reefs uh, in Eilat Aqaba are the most northern coral reefs in the world. There's a lot of research there. We do what's called mud building. Because there's not a lot of rain uh, in that part of the world, you can take straw bales of hay. You can then cover it with mud, paint linseed over it, and you have a structure. Um, and actually, our new offices were, are the old converted turkey coops of, of the kibbutz, where we did that. Um, and those are the walls that, that we have. So there's a lot of environmental architecture that students do um, research in um, as well. Environmental education. One of our students on the undergraduate level got very, very interested in the, the effectiveness of environmental education in the Israeli public school system. She eventually did her master's in that and was asked and invited to testify in front of the Knesset's uh, education committee to give them advice on what worked and what didn't work. And she's now doing her doctorate in that field and using a lot of uh, the Arva alumni as researchers um, to help her in that work. So when it comes to independent study, pretty much if there's something you want to study, we can create that and, and, and make it happen. So our goal is to, as I said, to create a future cadre of environmental leaders for, for the Middle East. To really effectively do that, you can't have a program um, that's fluff. Um, you need to have a deep understanding of the environmental issues that are there, but there is also, if you will, the camel in the tent. There's the conflict. And you can't avoid the conflict. Now, I will say that had we reversed the order of the institute and, pr and primarily made it an institute of peace studies, um, with the environment being secondary, again, we would have collapsed at the second intifada. Because while you know, peace can go up and down, and that can affect programs that are involved in peace, the environment is a constant. And so the fact that we front-loaded the environment in what we do and in what our mission is has served us in, in many, many ways. But having said that, one needs to deal with the conflict. And so we developed a component of the program called Peace Building and Environmental Leadership Seminar, or PELS, where we basically take the conflict and we shove it down the students' throats. Mm -hmm. And we use the notion of the double narrative that was developed by Dr. Sami Adwan of Bethlehem University and the late Dr. Baron of Ben Gurion University, which basically states that there are two narratives involved here. There's an Israeli narrative and there's a Palestinian narrative. Most people know one 
and really don't know the other. To not just know the other, but to really understand it, even if you don't agree with it, but to really understand it is a very, very difficult but essential process. So these sessions are incredibly difficult. Students will leave those sessions hurt, angry, and crying. Will often sometimes have to be literally dragged to those sessions. Whenever you speak to an alumni about the program, the first thing they're going to talk to you about is PELS because it really is the heart and soul of the program. It's really where we, we do, do some of our most important work. And things don't fall apart as difficult, and believe me, they get very, very difficult as they are. And I would argue for five reasons things don't fall apart. For one, the program is four months, eight months, or two years. Often when you bring Jews and Arabs together, it's for a weekend, maybe for two weeks. To really understand and to really begin to work with the other side, you need the luxury of time. And we have that. Because it also means that if you were at a Pell session, or, or not even a Pell session, but something happened, and somebody said, and you can say, you know, two weeks later, you can go to Muhammad and say, Muhammad, what did you mean by that? I didn't quite understand it. Or Shulamit, can you clarify exactly what you meant when you said what you said? They have the luxury of time to work through these issues. They don't have to get it immediately. And as much as you know, our good friend John Lennon said, instant karma is going to get you, it's not. It takes hard work. And to have the hard work, you need the time to work on it. It also means that if you're there together for a long period of time, it means that you get to know the person beyond the label of Muhammad the Palestinian or Shulamit the Israeli. It's Muhammad who's the great chef, and it's Shulamit who snores at night. And you get to meet each other as people, which again, you can only do if you've got the luxury um, of time as, as well. And so we've got the time in place. We're also located on Kibbutz Kitara. I think as many of you know, a Kibbutz is a community uh, of intent, where cooperation is the model of what brings people together and how they structure their world. So on the micro level, the students are coming into a community that understands cooperation that has real implications on the macro level when it comes to peace and the environment as well. There's also, so there's a wonderful interplay of having the program on, on the kibbutz. The students eat in the communal dining room. By the way, we do your laundry also in the communal laundry. You don't have to do your laundry the hut when you're there. Um, students can be adopted by kibbutz families if they like. And, and this particular kibbutz actually won the Knesset Speakers Prize some 15, 16 years ago for tolerance and pluralism. Israel is a very, very segregated society, not just between Arabs and Jews, but even within, with, within Jews and other communities. Um, so you have both religious and non-religious Jews living intentionally together on this kibbutz. And so they're walking into a community that already understands what it means to live with diversity. And the difficulty of, and how you work through that. So they're coming into a world that understands the importance of living with diverse points of view and different ways that people deal with things. We're also located in the desert. Um, and why some people may think that Middlebury is isolated, let me tell you something. You come to the desert, that's isolated. Um, you know, we don't have great speaker series like you hear, we don't have the movies and all that kind of stuff. And it really forces the students to become their own entertainment. It forces the students to become a body. It's really where these amazing friendships are formed because they've got no other choice but each other. In addition, the, the isolation of the desert, I mean, is why we are you know, clearly in, in the Middle East, and I'm going to talk about that in, in, in a second. We are removed from what we often call the tensions of the merkaz, of the center. Um, and so things are much calmer and quieter. It's not in contested territory, which also helps students work through um, the issues that they, that they need to work through. In addition, the program is in the Middle East itself. We often think the thing to make Israelis and Jews you know, work together and, uh, and Arabs to work together is we take them out of the pressure cooker. And we're going to bring them to Maine or to Italy or to Turkey. And there's something to that that works, and that, and, that, and that can be very helpful. The problem is, is that people over there don't even know their neighbor. And I'm not just talking about you know, Israelis and Palestinians and Jordanians, even with Israeli society. Israeli Jews and Arabs may go to college together and sit in the same classroom, but at the end of the day, they leave entirely separate, segregated lives. Our Israeli Arab and Israeli Jewish 
participants have all said, I finally got to meet my fellow citizen because we forced them to be roommates as we force Israelis and Palestinians and Israelis and Jordanians to also be roommates. And so they have the opportunity to learn about the milieu of that part of the world, about their own neighbors. Um, if, for example, your Jordanian roommate's sister is getting married in Amman, not only do you go to the wedding, but the entire program goes to the wedding. It means on weekends that you can then take your Jordanian roommate up to Kibbutz Tirat Zvi. And so people get to learn about that part of the world, which they really don't even know each other there. For those of you in this room, why it's so important, why we have one third of the student body not being from the Middle East, there is a certain level of um, being the outsider that can help in the dynamics of those students from the Middle East when they're there. But even more important, our engagement with the Middle East has been going on for decades, if not centuries. And we know so little bit about that part of the world, and we need to learn so much more. And there's only so much you can learn, whether it's at Middlebury or Harvard or UVM, in the classroom here. You need to go there and learn about that part of the world. I remember after 9-11, there was this appalling statistic of the number of Arab majors graduating from US universities. And I know that Middlebury certainly does you know, much better at that than most places. But we need to learn about that part of the world. In addition, they need to learn more about us. And when students from North America, and particularly the United States, go to a program like that, you become an ambassador for this culture, because they also have a very skewed view of what this place is all about, but what they see on the television as well. And they can very easily fall into the traps of the stereotypes of what we are as Americans. And so you play a, a, a role of both learning about that part of the world as also being a messenger about what this part of the world has to offer. And so the students who are not from the Middle East play a very, very crucial role as well. So we have that the program, the length of the program, that it's on a kibbutz, that it's in the desert, that it's in the Middle East. And finally, the fifth component of why things don't fall apart and why we're able to work through these issues is the environment itself. That when you look at that part of the world from the perspective of geopolitics, you see lines, borders, walls, and divisions. When you look at that exact same piece of real estate from the perspective of the environment, all of those divisions are wiped away. And you're not just invited, but you're forced to work with the other because the environment doesn't know and doesn't care about these political divisions that we've put into her soil. You know, and we're, we're literally on the border of Israel and Jordan, where the fields of the kibbutz end, Jordan begins. And so clouds, you know, go from west to east, they fly over the kibbutz, and they don't stop at passport control. They just keep on floating. Most of the water that we drink on the kibbutz is, is, a, is a huge water aquifer underground. Like 90% of that water aquifer lies in Jordan, not in Israel. You cannot talk about your own environment in that part of the world, just like we know that's true here. Vermont really doesn't produce a lot of pollution. We pollute some. Most of our pollution comes from our neighbors in Ohio and further west of us. The environment doesn't know from these divisions. And so the environment, particularly in that part of the world, becomes the level playing field, a metaphor and a glue that holds it all together, that transcends all of these differences, as well as providing a common purpose that every, everyone can work for and forward to and towards together when they're living together in that part of the world. And so the environment is a crucial, crucial point in doing this, but I would argue all these other pieces also allow for then those relationships to be created, as well as the knowledge that we give these future environmental leaders. So I now want to kind of go back to the, the laundry list of some of the environmental challenges in that part of the world, and in part how we're dealing with them, but also how some, some other um, organizations are as well. So I mentioned, for example, open spaces is, is becoming a, a, a larger and larger problem in that part of the world. We just did a, a, a three-year biodiversity study of the Arava Valley from the Dead Sea to the Red Sea and both the Israeli and Jordanian sides of the border, working with Israeli and Jordanian counterparts and also our students, both in the undergraduate and graduate levels, can participate in, in, these, in these research projects. So we have the academic program, and then we have this very, very active research department. And basically, we, we did the study and are making recommendations to the Israeli and Jordanian governments saying, these areas should be preserved as open space. These areas can have limited development. And if you're going to develop, you should have it here. We also discovered some new bugs that had never been uh, discovered before um, as, as well in the course of the process. Uh, rivers. 
Um, as I mentioned, um, the rivers in, in uh, Palestine, Israel, start in the West Bank. They flow through Israel to the Mediterranean. They are all polluted, some of them literally lethally. Some of you may remember the Maccabi Games um, a number of years ago in, in summer of 97 when the Australian team fell into the river and they died not by drowning, they died from just drinking the water. Um, all of the rivers, though, are polluted in that part of the world. Um, in, a, in a moment of, of black humor, I, uh, two weeks before the Second Intifada, the Arv Institute, Hebron University, and the Galil Society, we did a week-long um, study session going to uh, all three locations as, uh, um, before the academic year. And so we're in Hebron, uh, Hebron one day, and there's this, this river flowing out of Hebron, and it looks, it looks like milk. It's so polluted. And it, it takes the pollution both from Hebron, which is a, as a, you know, a Palestinian city, and also from Kiryat Arba, which is a, an Israeli settlement right nearby, and they all send their pollution into this river, and it carries on. And at one point, this um, professor from um, Hebron University kind of turned to me and he said, well, here's where we have Palestinian Jewish cooperation. Uh, but it also becomes the place where we can cooperate to stop that from, from happening together. So we actually have, uh, we've had a, a project now of Israeli and Palestinian teams looking at two of the rivers to try to model how do we clean all of the other rivers um, as, as well. One of the sources of pollution is um, the olive harvest is, is, is a very, very part of the economy of that part of the world, particularly part of the Palestinian economy. One of the byproducts of olives, when you grind them up and you have all of the brine and all of the, 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 the leftover meat of the olives, is it's, usually, it's dumped into the rivers and becomes a source of pollution. And so a number of, of Israeli and Palestinian NGOs got together. And this is one of, going to be one of my closing points, is the, the, the power of the non-government organizations in that part of the world, particularly when it comes to the environment. So some Israeli and Palestinian NGOs got together and said, we're going to bypass the, 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 the Palestinian Authority. We're going to bypass the Israeli government because we know if we go to them, this is never going to happen. And on their own, they were somehow able to get trucks from Israel to drive into the PA to get all this uh, leftover waste material and then bring it into Israel, where it was then treated where there were water treatment plants. Um, and so you have, you have many, many opportunities and examples where you have these kind of um, cooperation um, taking place as well. More Israelis uh, every year die from air pollution than terrorist attacks. Um, air pollution is becoming a growing, growing problem in that part of the world. If anyone has been in the kind of the coastal plain around Tel Aviv, uh, particularly around uh, rush hour on either side of the day. It's an exercise in uh, frustration and a lot of pollution. Um, in Haifa, there's the, the chemical plants in the, in the Bay of Haifa. And all that air goes up. And because of the air currents, it, they, it flows east, and it flows into the PA, and then eventually into Jordan. Um, but everyone likes to get in part of this game. So uh, within the PA, uh, in part, unfortunately, because of their, the, the horrible economic situation there, people have very, very old cars. So if you like old cars, um, you can go there and watch them. They also, unfortunately, then have old exhaust systems. And so the pollution that's produced by these cars is very, very problematic. And uh, in Jordan, for example, we often go to the, the Dana Nature Reserve, which is this wonderful nature reserve that, that overlooks the, the Jordan Valley just south of the Dead Sea. Nearby there is a, a cement factory where they, do, they, they just grind up the rocks, and they, they keep nothing to keep the small air particles going into the air, and so you have air pollution there as well. So we have this, this project now with Israeli, Palestinians, and Jordanians moder moderate, moderating, uh, monitoring. Um, small air particles, and then making recommendations on what should be done about that as, as, as well. I mentioned earlier the, the Dead Sea is disappearing at the rate of a meter a year, um, and it's because the main source of the, Jor of the Dead Sea is the Jordan River. The Jordan River has tributaries coming out of Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, um, Israel, and the PA. Um, there is, as you can imagine, no um, coordination with all of them. There's some work between Israel, PA, and Jordan on that. But until Lebanon and Syria come, come in, there's, you're really kind of limited on what you can, can do in that. So the Jordan River that is not even that mighty to begin with, as we sing in the song, um, has really been reduced to a trickle and in many ways has become a sewage dump um, leading into the Dead Sea. The annual evaporation rate in the Dead Sea is four meters a year. So that means if you want to maintain your level of water, you've got to have a lot of water rushing into the Dead Sea. If you, if you cut that off, which is what's happened, or lessened it, it's going to start lowering. And so the Dead Sea is, as I said, is disappearing at the rate of a meter a year. Um, what, one of the bi many byproducts of that is that you have sinkholes forming 
um, around the Dead Sea Basin, uh, both in Israel, the PA, and in Jordan. Because what happens, uh, if you, let's say this is the, uh, the land, let's say this is the original water line. So you have water going into the sea and water going into the land. It's very, very salty. As that lowers, the coast is exposed, but here you're left with very, very brittle dirt because there's so much salt in it. So when the winter rains come, they're very, very violent because they come in very short bursts. They just basically wash all of this away, and then you get these sinkholes forming. So there have been a number of um, responses to that. The Friends of the Earth Middle East that we work with a lot is doing some very, very important work in trying to basically restore the Jordan River and getting the governments to, to, to work on that. They've, they've done great stuff with getting the different Palestinian, Israeli, and Jordanian communities to cooperate and try to put pressure on their governments. We did a program with the Jordan Institute of Science and Technology modeling what it would be if there was, let's say, we, like we have a, um, a Tennessee River Authority. What If there was a Jordan River Authority, what would that look like and how would it work? Um, and so we, and one of the, we do a lot of environmental touring as part of our, part of the, the, the program at Arava. And one of them is actually we go up on the Jordanian side of the Jordan River and then we cross over and we go down the Israeli-Palestinian side of the Jordan River and, and look at both the similarities and dissimilarities of the challenges of, of, of the Jordan River. So restoring the Jordan River is one way to deal with the Dead Sea. Years ago, there was talk of the Med Dead Canal. You build a canal from the Mediterranean to the, to the Dead Sea. Problematic, it goes through mountains, it goes through a lot of the Palestinian Authority, it was stopped. Now the new talk is of the Red Dead Canal, where you build a canal from the Red Sea to the Dead Sea, um, because the Dead Sea is, you know, is the lowest point on Earth, the water will flow. At the bottom there, you can have turbines that will produce energy, that will operate a desalinization plant. The fresh water will go up to Amman, the salty water will go into the Dead Sea, and there'll be world peace. <laughs> that life was so simple. The World Bank is um, doing a, an initial investigation into this, and they've asked us to be part of the uh, environmental impact statement. For one, you're, you're building this on one of the major fault lines of the world. It's the Syrian African Rift. We've had huge earthquakes various centuries. Um, cities have been wiped out. So if you're going to pull a pipe with salt water going on top of all these three freshwater aquifers, you have an earthquake, it opens up, you've destroyed these aquifers forever. So that's one problem. The other problem is um, the amount of energy that um, is, is used in the plant. And, and more important, the stuff that you're then going to throw into the Dead Sea is going to have a different salt contact. It's going to have different microorganisms. You're probably then going to have a bifurcation of the Dead Sea with a, um, a heavier wall, a heavier wall there and, a, and a lighter water. So you're going to have kind of two levels, which will increase algae blooms, which will probably change the color of the Dead Sea, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it will be examined, and we're, and we're part of that. Um, but that is one of the, the major issues that we are, we are facing there um, as well. Some of you may have heard about the 2,000-year-old um, the date tree. Yes, no? OK, I will tell it. And I'm going to tell one or two more things, and then I'm going to close and really open for your questions. So there's the, uh, the historic fortress built by Herod in Masada. They found a number of years ago, or a couple decades ago, uh, seeds on the top there, and they sat in a little drawer at Hadassah Hospital. And about four or five years ago, they were given to Dr. Elaine Soloway, who was a founding member of Kibbutz Kitara and also a founding member of the Arava Institute. She was given five of them. She put them in five different solutions, and one of them actually germinated. And it's about so tall now, and we'll know in a year or two whether it's a female. And if it is, we're going to have a date, literally a fruit from this genus of this plant for the first time in 2,000 years. But she's this kind of wizard. Um, and she's doing a seed exchange with Morocco. And she has an orchard with plants and shrubs from around the world that grow in high salinity and low water. So kind of think about that, that swath of the Earth's surface. Many of the plants and shrubs that she's growing have medicinal qualities. So for example, there's the marula, which has the highest concentration of vitamin C of any fruit in the world. Um, how many people here have seen the movie Out of Africa? Do you remember the scene where the elephants get drunk? It's from marula. When marula falls to the ground, it begins to naturally ferment. The elephants eat it, and they get drunk. Um, but it has the highest concentration of vitamin C in the world. There's also the neem, which has, in its bark, has very, very good qualities for teeth. And there's the argani nut that grows on a shrub. Um, the Moroccans love to use it for couscous because of its flavor. But the oil of the nut actually lowers cholesterol. So she's looking at these and, and a number of other um, of, um, plants and shrubs 
um, that can grow in these conditions. She teaches um, sustainable agriculture, organic gardening. A lot of the students study with her, but it's also an example of stuff we're doing that can then be transposed to other parts of, of, of the world there as well. Solar, and then I'm going to close. Um, that part of the world doesn't have a lot of water, and it doesn't have a lot of oil, but it's got a lot of sun. And a new company has been started called the Arava Power Company that is going to be uh, basically transferring the fields of the kibbutz, kibbutzim into um, photovolt fields of photovoltaics, enough for a megawatt worth of um, electricity, enough for between a half a million and three quarters of a million homes in Israel, 5% of electric needs, and building a sister company on the Jordanian side of the border. Some of the highest solar radiation in the world is literally in the Arava, enough for about a quarter million homes. Legislation is going through the uh, Jordanian um, legislation now to make that, that easier for people to invest in. All of the research for that is going to be done at the Institute's Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Conservation. It's actually run by a Palestinian who lives on, on the kibbutz right now with, with his, his family. So, so those are some of the, the environmental issues, and I can certainly flush them out more. I just want to close by saying that a, a number of recent developments that we're very, very proud of. One is we now have an alumni association that's run entirely by our Israeli, Palestinian, and Jordanian alumni. They have an annual conference every year. This year, it's in Amman, Jordan, next week. They do workshops throughout the year where they're constantly in touch. And they have a listserv where they're always exchanging ideas. We try to provide them um, with seed money to do joint projects. They get involved in a lot of our research projects. We're just developing that here in North America, but really our focus is, is, is the Middle East as well. We have this new Center for Renewable Energy uh, that, I, that I just spoke about. And in terms of the, the recent events, I, I just want to say something. We had a... Um, one of our Israeli Jewish students who was living in Beersheba that was you know, getting bombed at the, at the time as well as Gaza was getting bombed, she came down to the program um, just to, 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 to be with her fellow students or for, former students. And it was a very, very intense period, this period of the Gaza war. And she was involved in some of those very, very intense discussions. But one of the Palestinian students from the West Bank who clearly had relatives in Gaza who were going through a very difficult time said, don't go back to Beersheba where it's not safe. Come live with our family in the West Bank where you can be safe. And this, this is the kind of relationships that we're, that we're able to produce. Something that wasn't in the news was uh, about three weeks ago, 100 Palestinian, Jordanians, and Israelis met on the Dead Sea to have a conclave about peace. It was so successful that they're doing another one next week. And part of what I want to close with that, the, the ebb and flow of diplomacy, the ups and downs of violence, A, the environment, is a constant, but also these Palestinian, Israeli, and Jordanian non-government organizations are a constant, who have already figured out how to work past and through the conflict, have created the models of what that part of the world can look like. And I really hope that when our new president goes to the Middle East, or when I am saying Senator, the, not Senator anymore, Secretary of State Clinton is going at the beginning of March, or when Special Envoy Mitchell goes, that they meet with the political leaders, but they also need to meet with the NGOs. Because these NGOs not only providing a model of what is possible, they will strengthen the vast majority of Israelis and Palestinians who want peace to happen, but then look around and say, what, am I crazy? In part because that's not what makes the newspapers. By them making those visits, by raising the visibility of what is possible, it can really change the landscape of what we can do in, the, in that part of the world. So thank you for having me, and I'm happy to take questions. Or you can walk out. <laughs> yes? The scene you present sounds like an engineer's paradise. You have problems, and everybody wants to generate solutions. And what occurs to me as I listen to this, I go, wow, the, in, the idea of sustainability is nowhere on the table, it's just nowhere here. The idea of limits is not here. We have a growing population. There's no discussion of limiting that population. We have uh, consumption. We expect it to rise. I mean, not only do you have problems now, you're guaranteed to have more problems. It's just, so it's going to be an engineering uh, 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 part of this university also, which is growing, which is just going this way. However, I think in terms of sustainability, what was it like? How long ago did this area go beyond the ability to sustain the population and enter just the crop? How long did the crop going on? And can we learn anything from looking at that? 
Yeah, I, I don't, yeah, that's a great question. I don't know exactly when the, that tipping point, if I can use that phrase, was reached. Let me let me say one thing and then go back to that. Is there's kind of a counterintuitive notion. I want to say three things. One is the whole issue of you know population is the great taboo, both religiously and nationalistically, that you just can't talk about. You can talk a little bit in this country, but certainly in that part of the world, you just can't talk about it for all the obvious reasons. But here's the the kind of counterintuitive piece that's kind of interesting and I'm, I, just to think about. One is that a, and this is, this, is, this is not a hard fact, but you'll understand the example I'm giving, that a poor family of 11, their environmental impact footprint on Mother Earth is smaller than a middle class family of four. And so we often think, well, if we get smaller families, then we're going to have a smaller environmental impact. Yes, but the caveat is, what kind of family is it? What are they going to do in their homes? What are, are they going to want to just you know, redo what we've done? And so that's one of the great challenges, this whole notion of reducing or simplifying. One of the things that I love about living on, on kibbutz is this is a community of 135 adults, 140 kids, another 100 people like me. And so they have 135 members, and they have about 11 cars. And it works. There's a sign-up sheet. You, every week that it goes up, if you know it weeks in advance, you put a little note in the thing, the guy sets up a schedule, and it works. It's not perfect, but there's always someone having a ride, and there's a public transportation there as well. So there's a model, I mean, I guess these new zip cars are a, you know, a way of looking at that, but you know, people keep saying that you know, we're gonna have to change our lifestyles drastically. I'm not so sure it needs to be so dramatic, but it just needs to be more, we need to be more conscious of how we do things, and how we, like, how can, why does everybody on my street have a lawnmower? Like, why don't we, you know, I even got, there's one of those in Virgins that's, you know, completely, you know, it's a battery-powered one, so I feel a bit better about it. But why, why, don't, why don't we share our lawnmowers? You know, every 10 houses, there should be one lawnmower. So that's, that's part of the answer. I, I don't even want to guess on where, when that tipping point was. I'm more the theologian than the scientist here. So, but, but, but it doesn't mean that we can't still deal with that question. I mean, Singapore, I guess, has a much um, denser population than that part of the world, and they seem to be doing well. Um, obviously, they have different and easier challenges than, than, than we do. Yeah. Is that one of the questions that you shove down your students' throats that they can discuss? And I'm also wondering, since you say, you know, obviously it depends on the footprint that you create, but if you're talking about sewage problems and water problems, no matter how someone is living, they're still going to produce the same amount of sewage and require the same amount of water. I mean, there are certain um, certain constants. Well, um, one is we, we pretty much we shove the conflict down their throats, but but that but in the class the other classes I mentioned the issue of population does come up and we and we do address it there. I'm talking about more on kind of the, the grander scale in terms of the cultures there on uh, on on mass. You really can't talk about that. In terms of, you know, water, I mean, there are ways of how you design houses on how much water you are going to need. And you can build smarter and still live well and not use as, and produce as much water or recycle it. I mean, there's a whole use of gray water and black water, and, and you recycle that. So there are ways of doing it smarter where you can actually reduce the amount that, that is being produced. But so are you saying that your assessment is given that the population is going to continue to increase, and from your point of view, your, your job is to respond to that increase? Um, unless we kill each ourselves off, I fear for certainly the next couple of decades, I don't see that line getting much slower. Uh, I could be, listen, there's so many variables in this world in life, you never know when things are going to happen. But this stage of the game, it looks like it's going to keep going like that, and we need to adjust accordingly. It would be nice if it went like this. I don't see that happening there, and I don't see that happening in lots of parts of the world either, not just in that part of the world. It's a, it's a great challenge that, that, that we face. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Yes. Have any of your students considered um, coupling with travel industries you know, that are doing these tours of the Holy, Holy Land to raise consciousness that way about the environmental <coughs> conditions of the Middle East? Yeah, it's a, that's a great question. We, I mean, I know some of our students get involved in ecotourism, but I don't know where they've wedded kind of tours to the Holy Land to that. And I think there's a great opening there, particularly the evangelical churches have really embraced the environment as an issue. Um, and that's actually, that's a, that's a great point that I will take back with me to the alumni. That's a, that's a wonderful point. Thank you. Student, yeah. I was wondering, if you're more of a theologian, so I was wondering, in 
kind of, I know there's a little bit of a uh, <coughs> grassroots, grassroots movement in Judaism of how to kind of approach the environmental through Jewish texts and perspective. I was wondering if there's also that movement or the possibility for that movement um, in the Muslim Christian traditions, and then also if you use the kind of religious uh, framework to tackle the joint problems and food problems. So, you know, so, you know, as I said, you know, post this, post this photo of the Earth and then Earth Day, and then there was a famous article by Lynn White where Lynn White basically blamed all of the environmental problems on the Judeo-Christian um, view of, of the world. Um, and that really got a lot of Jews and Christians' backs kind of riled. That, in some ways, it was great because then there was this great response, and Jews and Christians started going back, and really it was the birthing of both the Christian and the Jewish environmental movements in Islam, there is also that movement. It's, it's a couple of decades behind, but it's beginning to gain steam as well and, and recognition. Um, and so that, I think, will become also a growing force in, in, in how this is, this is dealt with. At the Institute, we, we, you know, we certainly will bring this in as a piece of the puzzle. Our approach is really interdisciplinary. So we look at the environment and solve in the environment from, you know, whether it's religious, from economic, from political, from sociological, and we just put it all into the mix. Because just like the environment is diverse, and the best way to understand the, the environment is to understand the diversity of the environment, it's the same thing with issues of human beings as, as well. Other questions? Yes. Uh, to what extent do the political differences and conflicts interfere with your projects? In terms of the research projects, it becomes often the issue of crossing borders, which often is more of a problem for um, Jordanians and Palestinians coming into Israel um, because of the whole permitting system that they need permits to come in. Um, and so we, and one of, when I was doing Palestinian student recruitment, I, one of the, this is one of the things that I had to deal, deal with, and actually I had formed a, um, a coalition of, at that point, U.S. Ambassador Jones to Israel, some members of the Knesset, including uh, Yuri Stern, who was the founder of Yisrael Batenu, which is, you all know from the recent elections, is this very, very right-wing um, nationalistic party uh, in Israel. They were our greatest supporters in the Knesset, even though we were dealing with Palestinians as well, because they understand the importance of the environment. And this is one of the things about the issues of the environment. At the end of the day, people may disagree on where the final line should be, but people understand that the environment doesn't care and that it needs to be, needs to be dealt with. Um, long story short, we didn't get anywhere in getting Palestinian student permits that year. We eventually went to the Israeli Supreme Court and they overturned the ban and that's how we started getting Palestinians again two, two years ago. Um, and so when it comes to research, we're, we often deal with, with these, these problems um, as, as well. And then when there's troubles, Israelis aren't allowed to go into the West Bank. Certainly Israelis can't go into Gaza right now. And so those are, those, those are not so much, we don't have problems in terms of the government supporting what we do. It's more kind of the raw, you know, day-to-day -day stuff on the ground that, be, that often becomes the, the, the blockages that we have to work through or work around as we sometimes learn to do. Yeah. Where do you get your funding? from anyone in the audience. Um, we get a lot of our funding from the US government, as I mentioned earlier, through uh, these grants uh, from USAID, the Office of Conflict Management and Mitigation, you know, Senator Leahy has helped us with. There's also a, another branch of USAID called Middle East Regional Cooperation Grants, or Merck Grants. A lot of the cross-border research I talked to you about has been funded through Merck. Um, we've also gotten funding through NATO. We've gotten funding from the European Union. We go to you know, family foundations, we go to public foundations. Every year we do a bike ride event from uh, um, Jerusalem to a lot. It is a great way to see the country. It raises a considerable amount of money for us um, as well. And we have our students along the way giving environmental lectures. You know, small, uh, we have individuals. Manti Patenkin is on our board. He's done some concerts for us. Susan Silverman did a benefit for us this past year. So we try to spread it out, diversify as much as possible um, in terms of how we, how we raise funds. Yeah, yeah. Both in terms of the students going on the program, both in terms of the support and those involved with the board here as well. And we've just uh, and the board in Israel is just kind of getting off the ground um, and beginning to explore fundraising uh, there as well. Yes. Do you have it one time? In Typically, right now we have usually between thirty and forty students. We kind of began the first year we had twenty five students, and we kind of started inching up to 40, and then the second intifada hit, we went down to 18. We started working our way up, but then we went down. And so now we're in the 35 to 40 range. Um, we have um, 
plans to expand the campus. We'd like to get to 60 um, in, the, in the short while and then eventually get larger than that. I mean, part of what we feel like we won't have a real impact on that part of the world, we need to be graduating more graduates. And the only way to do that is to have a larger campus, so that's kind of where we, we've kind of maxed out at 40 um, right now. And, and um, as was said, I was on the founding faculty in 96, and I went back 2000, 2001, and was back again 204 to 206, and we just got word that there's housing for us again, so we're going to go back this summer for the fall semester, so I'll be teaching one of my two classes there as well and, and doing other projects there. Still, yeah. from friends or home answering his cell phone in the negative said he was in Cairo on an extended stay because he was, it, it would have been a dicey thing for him to say he was studying in Israel. So how does right. that affect So let me, let me first do students, then I'll go to the faculty. So um, in terms of the, the students, it's interesting that the, when Palestinians want to come to study with us, they really don't feel any pressure from friends or family, because as bad as the relations are between Israeli and Palestinians, it's a known entity, it's a known quantity. On some levels, I'm saying we've got to figure this out. With Jordanians, it's, it's, it's much more difficult. Um, most of the Jordanians, when they decide to come on the program, um, first of all, we advertise, we put an ad out in the paper, it says, come study in the Arava Valley. It doesn't say where. People call a phone number, they eventually find it's in Israel, they self-select out, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Many of the Jordanians will be under fierce pressure from their parents, their family members, relatives, and friends not to go. They're told, listen, if you have a Jewish roommate, you're going to be stabbed at night in the back, and you're, you know, they, they literally fear for their lives. So these are very, very brave individuals who come, um, and they will often go back and change the perceptions of those very same family members and friends. Um, and I could give you story after story of where that took place, including one of our Jordanians who basically brought his six Israeli and American Jewish friends back to his home one weekend and introduced them to his parents and then left the room and said, you guys deal with it. He called it, sh he called it shock therapy. And he came back and at the end, of course, they're all talking and getting along really well. And then when they left, his mother said, very perceptive, says, you know, because these were all Jews who he had brought, he said, I found I was more connected to the Israelis than the Americans. And it was like, yeah. Um, and those are the kind of kind of dynamics that can happen. Unfortunately, many of the Jordanians are also blacklisted when they go back. Uh, and, and, and it's, um, well, the Jordanian government supports the process, and uh, the Jordanian ambassador, Prince Eid, has been, become a very good friend and advocate for us. And you know, on, on that strata of, these, of the Jordanian government, there's great support for this kind of work. In the street, it's very, very problematic. Um, and until the conflict is, so is solved, it's going to continue to be problematic. In Egypt, it is, as they call it, the cold peace. I mean, there we know even the Egyptian government puts pressure on students not to come on the program. We've had Egyptians, we had two the first year, and we haven't had Egyptians since then. We've had two recently who wanted to come, and they just got, they were too scared, not because of their family and friends who encouraged them to go, but because of the government officials. Um, and that's the reality of that, that part of the world, but you still keep pushing forward. When it comes to faculty members, um, kind of concentric circles, we have some faculty members who live full-time in the kibbutz. Most of the staff are, are, are kibbutz members. Um, we then have a number of faculty members from the region because we do a lot of study of the, of the Arva Valley, so if people live on other kibbutzim. Um, Israel is a very small country, and the flight from you know, Tel Aviv to Eilat is 45 minutes, so teachers will commute from the north down. They'll either stay for a day, they might stay for a day or two. Um, we've really been trying to work on getting, um, like I said, we have, we have Tariq, who runs the Center for Renewable Energy, is a Palestinian. Uh, we have another Arab faculty member. We're trying to increase the number of Arab faculty members. We're trying to increase the number of women faculty members. Um, we usually have a slot open for visiting faculty members from, from overseas as well. Um, and so that's kind of the, the mix that we do there, and it's, it's still a work in progress. Yeah. Esperanto. <laughs> I love that question. No, it's, I mean, for better and worse, Engl it's English, because English, for better and for worse, is really the langua franca of the world these days. Um, but what's, what's nice is that there's a lot of informal learning, teaching of Hebrew and Arabic and English. Remember, for most of the Middle Eastern students, he English is either their second or third language. 
So we create tutorials with the students from North America to help them out. Our dream is, and not to be in competition with Middlebury, but maybe we should talk about doing this jointly, is once we increase the size of our campus in the summer to have a joint uh, Hebrew, Arabic, and English intensive language course in the summer before the students come on the program. And kind of each of the groups have their own interest of wanting to learn the other language. But that's kind of where that's further down the line. Yeah? Your categorization of students, I thought was interesting because you're categorizing as Jews, Arabs, and others. Uh -huh. Do you ever get students from the non-Arab Islamic world? We, we try. We have not succeeded. Um, and also, it, the, the terminology is very complicated because when you, know, when you say Jewish, do you mean Jewish religion? Do you mean Jewish nationality? When you say Arab, is it... So, so the, the, the terms are fluid because they're, it's, it's, once you start using one, you're in a category. That means if you use the, the term of the other person, well, then you're locked in either the religious or the national one. So it's, it's not always, you know, it's, it's, it's not consistent because you can't be consistent. Um, we've, had, we've been better luck. We've had students from you know, South America and from Europe. Um, many of our Jordanians are not Muslim, by the way. They're, they're, they're Christian. Um, and so we kind of always think of the Arab world as being you know, all Muslim. Well, there's also Christians in the Arab world. And we, and we get many of those students um, as well. I've been in conversation with a, um, a Lebanese student. I've always wanted to do kind of, you remember there's ping pong diplomacy between you know, the US and China. I've always wanted to do environmental diplomacy and get somebody from one of the, the countries that doesn't yet have a peace treaty with Israel to come study with us. So I'm in a conversation with somebody from Lebanon right now. Um, but we haven't had any from Southeast Asia or, or, other, or other parts of Asia, no. Yeah. We've done recruiting in Turkey, and we, we haven't succeeded there, but we, we hope that at some point we would love to have some, uh, some students from Turkey. And often Turkey is the place where um, Palestinians and Israelis and Jordanians will meet um, because it's close by, and Turkey has relations with all three, and so that's where a lot of the, a lot of the meetings in the Middle East take place uh, is in Turkey. Yeah. Um, it's, well, it depends on which one. There's lots of, there's the mountain aquifer, that is basically most of it's under the West Bank um, that Israel takes. And here's an interesting question. The majority of the aquifer is in the West Bank. The water percolates, though, out in Israel. And so there's a whole debate on then who should own it. Um, obviously, the Palestinians claim, well, we should own it because the majority is, you know, it's under our territory. And the Israelis say, well, it's percolating under our line, so we can use it. Um, and this goes, this, goes, this goes back and forth. But all the water aquifers on some level are are if they're not being overused, they are on, on schedule to be overused because of the amount of people over there and the amount and how we live our lives and, and so on and so forth. I mean, there is, you know, there's been some, you know, better work in terms of using gray water and black water and recycling water and drip irrigation. But at this point, it's, it's just not enough to keep up with the, the water needs. And there's a big debate in Israel, you know, I think something like 60% of Israel's fresh water goes for agriculture. You know, does that make sense or not? Um, as you said, there's lots of opportunities there. It's 1.30, so I think we'll close the colloquium part of this now. Thank you all for coming, and thank you. Thank you.